Uh, welcome to first course on power systems, uh, module 12. And in this, we will look at uh, transmission line faults. And uh, this is our reference book from which uh, this material is taken. So in this uh, module, we will look at, uh, uh, we will not look at uh, relaying and circuit breakers. We'll just talk about transmission line faults. And we'll look at uh, the causes of these faults. Uh, how do we analyze them uh, using symmetrical components, the type of faults, and then uh, uh, we have to know the system impedance for these fault calculations. And then uh, uh, we'll see how we can analyze and calculate the fault currents, and also how to calculate them in large networks. Okay, So this part here we'll see in the next module. Um, so let's uh, start. Uh, so what are the causes of transmission line faults? They, they can happen uh, at any time. Uh, for example, uh, tree branches near the right of way could fall on transmission lines, uh, shorting them to ground. So that can happen. And uh, sagging transmission lines can touch uh, trees underneath. Uh, so overloaded transmission lines can uh, sag. Uh, and uh, if uh, proper maintenance is not there, they can touch uh, trees, and uh, that can be a, a line-to-ground fault. And then uh, there's uh, this common occurrence of this backflash. So what is this backflash? What happens is that, let's say the transmission line tower or one of the ground wires is struck by lightning. So that lightning uh, consists of, uh, let's say, of, you know, several hundred kilo amperes of current. Uh, uh, Let's uh, think of uh, that way. And when it goes through the tower footing impedance, uh, that raises the potential of the tower. And if there are no surge arresters, then uh, the insulator string can uh, spark over. Okay, And quite often, that's, uh, uh, that's self-healing. But if uh, the, the insulate, insulator or insulators uh, fly apart, then you have a uh, sort of a permanent fault, and they have to be repaired. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, this can be another cause of uh, fault on transmission lines. <clears throat> so why do we need to worry about these faults? Well, uh, first of all, we need to set relays. So they can detect these faults and then isolate them uh, by opening the transmission line, perhaps. And then when the fault is clear, reclosing their transmission lines. So that's the uh, the function of relays, and uh, so we need to know what the limit of these uh, fault currents are so that uh, we can properly set them, and relays can then distinguish them with normal load currents. <coughs> the other, other, another reason to analyze these uh, short circuit faults is that, after all, when we open these transmission lines under faulted conditions using circuit breakers, the circuit breaker rating should, should be sufficient uh, should, the circuit breaker should be capable of interrupting that fault current. So we need to know by analysis what they will be. <clears throat> All right. So let's, uh, let's look at these faults. Let's say this is a transmission line and uh, a three-phase transmission line and ground over here. And this is uh, some point F where the fault occurs. And uh, think of uh, uh, the, these uh, three currents coming out of here. IA, IB, and IC, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we will be analyzing them not in time domain, but in phasor domain. So think of them as phasor currents, IA, IB, and IC. And they may be unbalanced. We are not saying that they are balanced. But our assumption here is the network, looking at uh, the network into the network from this fault point is balanced. And that network could be unbalanced too. And, uh, you know, there are techniques to analyze unbalanced networks as well. But uh, by and large, uh, for most studies, we can assume that the network uh, looking into from the fault point is uh, balanced as far as the phases are concerned, although the fault may be unbalanced. And that makes uh, making that assumption, which is quite valid in, in most cases, yeah, makes it uh, much easier to analyze these faults. So that would be the basis for our discussion 
as we move forward to assume a balanced network. But the fault could be unsymmetric. All right. <clears throat> so before we can analyze this, uh, we need to know a little bit about symmetrical components. Okay. So there was a landmark paper by uh, uh, this engineer many years ago, and where he showed that an unbalanced set of currents can be represented by the symmetrical components. So, you know, let's say that you have three currents, IA, IB, and IC, and by the way, these could be voltages. So currents are just uh, taken here for as an example. So these three currents, uh, and let's say they're unbalanced. So in this phasor diagram, you have IA here, IB here, and IC here. And you can see that they are unbalanced. They are not uh, equal in magnitude, and they are not 120 degrees apart. Okay? So they are unbalanced. But they can be represented by means of balanced set of uh, positive sequence components. So this one here stands for positive, and uh, 2 stands for negative, okay, and 0 for 0. So uh, these three positive sequence uh, uh, components, uh, they form uh, a balanced uh, set, I, I, IA1, IB1, and IC1, and these phases are always taken to be rotating are uh, the sequences uh, counterclockwise, and so is the case here like this here, okay? So this is the positive sequence. Positive sequence meaning uh, A, B, and C. First A peaks, then phase B peaks, and then phase C. So that's positive sequence. Uh, but in addition to these positive sequence uh, components, we also have this negative sequence. And uh, as you can see here, they also are balanced, uh, IA2, IB2 and IC2, but you see here that uh, in this case, IC2 lags behind IA2 by 120 degrees, whereas when it was a positive sequence, IB1 was lagging behind IA1 by 120 degrees. So that's what makes it negative sequence, okay? <clears throat> and in addition, uh, you, we could have a zero sequence here, and uh, these are equal and they are in phase, as shown here, okay? So we can clearly see that, uh, I mean, this, you know, this, this is taken from a numerical example, so the, uh, these components are what they should be, and you can see that if I concentrate on this current IA, it's made up of this IA1 here, which is this one here, then this is IA2, okay? Uh, Maybe I should put 2 here, IA2, which is this one here, and then this is IA0, which is any one of these here, right here. So if you add these three vectorially, uh, because these are phasors, you get IA, okay? And similarly, you can follow along and do uh, IB and IC, they are made up of these uh, sequence components here. <coughs> All right. So, uh, to go forward with this, uh, you know, rather than writing them longhand, this uh, one one with an angle of 120 degrees, we'll use an operator A, okay, just as a, uh, you know, uh, to simplify, which is, uh, you can see numerically it's equal to this value. And then uh, for one with an angle of 120 degrees, uh, it's uh, A squared, uh, which is, you know, A times A would be one times angle of 120 degrees which has a numerical value over here. So what we will do is we will try to represent all the sequence components in terms of uh, the A phase sequence components, okay? So IB1, as you can see here, is equal to IA1 times this operator A squared because it is uh, 120 degrees over here, right? Similarly, IC1 is equal to IA1 times A, because it's only leading by uh, uh, 120 degrees, okay? And similarly, you can say about IB2 uh, in terms of IA2 and IC2 
in terms of I A two over here. Okay, so what the attempt is uh, just to repeat everything we want to express in terms of phase A sequence component. So I A of course consists of I A one plus I A two plus I A zero. We saw that earlier, but now I B uh, instead of I B one we put this. Instead of I B two we put this, and instead of I B zero we put this over here in terms of phase A. And the same thing we do for phase C. Okay, so we have these three equations here, and we can write them in this matrix form. So these are the phase currents, and these are the sequence components of phase A, and uh, these two are related by this matrix here, consisting of this operator A, uh, one and uh, A and A squared. <clears throat> so the next thing is, to, uh, in, if we want to calculate the sequence components in phase A, uh, in, in, with respect to the given phase currents in three phases, uh, we can just invert this matrix and we get this here, right? And just a matrix inversion to get this. And once you have the sequence components for phase A, uh, we can find the sequence components for phases B and C. Th those are given by these equations over here. <coughs> so that's what uh, we will do, okay? <coughs> 